You know, to be honest, I like combed my hair before I did this and I don't even really know why, especially since I'm just going to put a hat on right here. Anyways, hey, what is going on everyone? It's me, Mr. Mario, and for anyone new to this channel or you're just checking out this video, you haven't been here for a while, whatever it is, there's some videos I like to do where I just like to kind of sit at this table here, fill it with stuff. This is the most I've filled this table with stuff for a video. And I just talk about whatever the topic is, and the topic of this video is going to be me discussing the PS4K, the PS4 Neo, now it's the PS4 Pro, I don't know, I still can't get the nicknames out of my head for some reason. And the Xbox Scorpio, because a lot of people seem to really be comparing and contrasting these ever since. Not only the official announcements, but even with all the leaks of stuff that happened. I mean, we do have specs out for the Xbox Scorpio, and we know that the PS4 Pro now exists. And my thing that I'm kind of questioning here is... With the Xbox Scorpio coming out, and we know for sure, compare spec for spec, the Xbox Scorpio will be more powerful than the PS4 Pro, which is now going to be a change of events because the PS4 is more powerful than the Xbox One. And that's a factual thing right there. Now, for anybody that thinks I'm trying to be biased or whatever it is, I got the systems right here. I got an Xbox One right here. I got a PS4. I also own a Wii U, but it's off camera right now. But point is, I, I like both systems. I do favor the PS4 more, that's just my preference, but, you know, just trying to put that out there. I'm trying not to do the fanboy thing, and I've, I don't know, I kind of got over the fanboy thing, like, back in high school, honestly. I'm pretty unbiased when it comes to this stuff at this point. But really, the only thing that the Xbox One current day has over the PS4 is that stock Xbox One, stock PS4, the Xbox One does have a faster clocked CPU. And I've talked about this multiple times. While as that's not a bad thing... The PS4 does have the faster and better RAM, it has the better GPU, and several other features as well too in there that are going to be more optimized for gaming. So while it's not bad having a higher clocked CPU, that alone isn't going to make the system all the more powerful. I mean, hell, I didn't even really mean to do this, and I didn't realize it until I was saying that out loud. But we even have the two systems right here, the Sega Genesis and the Super Nintendo, where the Sega Genesis had blast processing. And what that meant was the Sega Genesis had a better CPU than, or a faster CPU, excuse me, than the Super Nintendo. But spec for spec, the Super Nintendo beat out the Genesis on every single spec except for the CPU. The CPU on the Genesis was slightly faster, or I don't even know if it was slightly, but the point is the CPU was faster on the Genesis than it was the Super Nintendo. So, you know, you're still dealing with that. But you still seem to see more advanced games, I would say, on the Super Nintendo looking back now compared to the Genesis. Although the Genesis still absolutely love this system. So now getting into this, you gotta have to bear with me because uh, I got my thinking hat on. As you can see, it's getting to be about that time. I mean, fall and winter's coming up, so uh, we get to put the hats on back here and they're gonna return to the channel. But the other thing is, I'm gonna straight up tell you all this, and I'd like to know your contributions in the comments section. Ultimately, I don't know. I don't know if the PS4 Pro is going to do better than the Xbox Scorpio. I don't know if the Xbox One brand, after the Scorpio comes out, is going to do a whole lot better than the PlayStation 4 brand. Or if the PS4 brand is, you know, going to still succeed completely. I honestly don't know. Because when I was comparing and contrasting it today in my head, for every win, I can find a failure. Like, I can't just say, oh, because of this example right here, one of these systems is going to do better. I always find another example that says, oh, well, this was also the opposite thing that happened. So first off, I just want to talk about the hardware refreshes. This is going to be a bit of a long video, so bear with me on here. But, I mean, if you've seen the timestamp on the video, you know what you're getting yourself into. Hardware refreshes are nothing new to any system. That's why I have so many out here right now. Let's start with some of the oldest ones. I mean, we have the Sega Genesis right here, for otherwise known as the Sega Mega Drive, to anybody across the pond. This right here is the... Well, one of the original ones. It's not the high-definition model, but it is the original Sega Genesis. And with that, they ended up making the Sega Genesis Model 2. They made something that was smaller. They ended up removing a few features on it as well. As you can see, this thing, it actually has stereo output right on the front, and it has a volume jack and everything. The Model 2 does not. However, it is still ultimately the same system, just slimmed down, cheaper, and missing a few features. It's not as bad as the Genesis 3, where I don't have the Genesis 3, but the Genesis 3... Fun fact on here, the Sega Genesis had a few architectural issues with that. A few games actually used those architecture issues to its advantage. 
they were fixed on the Genesis 3 and I believe the Nomad. So some games actually don't work properly on the later revisions of the Genesis because Sega ended up fixing those. So for ultimate cat compatibility, you need a Model 1 or a Model 2. But point is, it's just same system really. They just ended up removing a few things. And on the Genesis 3, they also took out the expansion port right here. So you couldn't hook up a Sega CD to it. And not only Sega, but we've seen Nintendo do it as well too. I have a original Super Nintendo right here for... I don't know if I have any viewers in Japan, but uh, Super Famicom, for anyone who doesn't know, people should know that though. So I got that, and then they ended up releasing the Super Nintendo Junior, where they ended up taking out a few features, and they just made it smaller, lighter, and they sold it for cheaper. So again, common thing. And even, you know, right here, we'll take a look at this, the PlayStation 2 and the PlayStation 2 Slim. PS2, absolutely love this console. Great system for a lot of different reasons. On the PS2 Slim, they end up releasing this. Again, lighter, smaller, cheaper, and missing a few things. It doesn't have hard drive functionality. It only has a uh, Ethernet network plug on there, so... God for I don't know why you would play games on dial-up, but uh, if you have dial-up, you can't play games on there easily, although... If you have dial-up and, I mean, you have the network jack on here, you can't play. Point is, don't play over dial-up. That's what I'm trying to say. But yeah, then they made things just more plastically, less mechanical and all that stuff. So again, just a cheaper system. But overall, like the Super Nintendos, like the Genesis consoles, these systems are really ultimately the same. But we also have some hardware refreshes where things were done a bit differently as well, too. We have the Xbox 360s right here. This is the original Xbox 360, as you can see. This thing, I don't really need to talk too much about it because I've made quite a few videos about it, but they end up releasing the Xbox 360 Slim. Again, smaller form factor system, runs cooler, should have a few things fixed up on there, but there was also another difference on this thing as well. It actually added wireless functionality and capabilities into the console itself so you no longer had to rely on a wired connection or use a separate wireless dongle or anything of the sort. So they ended up adding some functionality into there and strengthened a few things on all that stuff. So that's one of those examples where they added things in. But now we're actually starting to see systems where we're doing this like system and a half. We're doing like the Xbox One and a half or the Xbox or the PlayStation 4 and a half, whatever it is, uh, where not only they're going to get new types of variants, but they're also going to be more powerful. And I thought of it after I made another video, you know, talking about the PS4 uh, Pro and everything. And this isn't the first time Sony's done it. Um, this is probably one of my favorite systems. This is my favorite handheld of all time, man. And this has a lot of sentimental value to me. This is my my original, my very first, my original PSP 1000 model. Now, I didn't get this on launch, but it is a 1000 model. It is the first model that you could buy. And they ended up releasing several other models. The 2000, the 3000, and right here, the PSP Go. Now, as you can see, this thing, smaller form factor, absolutely no UMD drive, so it has built-in storage and does not use physical UMD discs to play games. However, another thing, after they released the PSP 1000, all the models after that had more RAM on them. Therefore, you actually had a bit more of an advantage because the system ended up loading games a lot faster. So... This is not the first time Sony has changed the spec on a system. So you had quite a few games that just didn't load up as fast on here. And I don't have it on me right now, but also the 3DS versus the new 3DS. New 3DS ended up having, you know, um, just more power to it and everything. So a good amount more power, actually, compared to the original 3DS. So that's also another example of at least Nintendo doing that. So point is, Nintendo and Sony have done that. Microsoft, they've just really done aesthetic things here as you can see so sony has a little bit of history with that and nintendo recently proved you know with this generation at least on the handhelds that it is possible to release a console and a half variant so have a system in the same family not have a new generation have the same system but a beefier version and have it succeed as i said in my previous video talking about the ps4 slim and the ps4 pro Nintendo proved that you don't even need to have a damn power cable with your system. The new 3DS is sold without a power cable, and that thing sold exceptionally well. So, blame Nintendo for all this. <laughs> but now let's talk about the actual PlayStation 4 and the Xbox One. So, the Xbox, I don't have an Xbox One S, by the way. But the Xbox One S, that's also another system, and that's just a system that has 4K upscaling capabilities, it has a 4K Blu-ray player in it, and it plays games slightly better because it has a bit more of a powerful CPU and I think a bit more of a powerful GPU compared to the stock Xbox One. It's not so much an Xbox One and a half, it's more like 
an Xbox One and a tenth, maybe. I guess we could call it that. It's a little bit more powerful, but it's not really powerful enough, at least for me, to justify a whole new spec and a whole new system on there. Granted, though, games will play a tad bit better on the Xbox One S. Then we have the PS4. By this time, maybe when you're watching it, because this system is supposed to be coming out within less than a week when I'm recording this video, the PS4 Slim is going to be coming out, which is the exact same thing as the PS4, except slimmer, lighter, it's going to use less power, and it's also going to be, it's going to be missing the digital audio output feature on there. However, it is going to have 5 gigahertz Wi-Fi on it as well, and probably a just stronger Wi-Fi card overall. So that's going to be a nice added little feature that's going to be added into there, but again, it's not going to be, spec-wise, it's still the same. It's not going to be more powerful or anything, so it's not really deserving of, as you know, a PS4 and a half title. But we're talking more about the PS4 Pro and the Xbox One Scorpio. Two consoles that a lot of people are talking about making a fuss about, and neither of them are out yet. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hypothetically put us in November. November 10th is out, right? Let's say that. The PS4 Pro just came out. It's out there. Now, one thing I will say, the PS4 Pro is going to have a major leg up and advantage on over the Scorpio is that it's going to be coming out 13 months earlier. That's a long time, dude. That is a long time. These systems, we don't want to think about it, but these two systems right here are three and a half years old at this point. They're not new systems anymore. So, 13 months, a lot of time can pass. In two months, we've shown that a lot of time can pass. But even with this right here, we're going to be seeing that it's going to be coming out first. Now, we already know on specs that the Xbox Scorpio is going to be more powerful than the PS4 Pro. And we know that. And historically, up until this point, the PlayStation 4 has been more powerful than the Xbox One. Let's just... Let's just all agree with that, right? We're going to have that out there. Now, yes, out of this console generation, it's looking like the Xbox Scorpio is going to be the most powerful console out of, you know, the Xbox One and PS4 libraries and even, you know, including the Wii U. The NX, some people are going to say that. The NX is not going to be a current, you know, current generation console. It's not going to be an eighth generation console. I'm assuming we don't even know what it is at this point, but... I'm pretty sure that's going to classify as a ninth generation console, so get the NX talk out of here. But point is, out of the eighth generation, we know that the Xbox Scorpio is going to be the most powerful. I know I'm repeating myself several times, but I'm just just bear with me on there. So with that, I feel like the PS4 Pro is still going to be doing quite a good job with the sales and everything. And as I said, the reason why I say that is because one, the PS4 already has been outselling the Xbox One, and that's been for several reasons. First off, it's been the more powerful console. We have seen that right there. And second, it's kind of the Xbox One's image. You see, the Xbox One has had a very hard life in its poor, poor console life cycle. Now, some people might say, oh, it's selling horribly. It's not. The Xbox One is not selling horribly. Some people try and say that it's not selling horribly. Is the PS4 most of the time selling better than the Xbox One? Yes, it is. But it's not like the Xbox One has only moved 2 million units in the past three years. The Xbox One is selling well, just not as well as the PS4. And that's for a variety of different things. Right out of the gate, before the system was even announced or anything, we were hearing rumblings about DRM. They tried to put DRM onto the system. I made a whole other video about this. They ended up removing it. They've been trying to fix their image. They got rid of Don Matrip. They brought in Phil Spencer. It originally had the Kinect. They took the Kinect out of there. They've been trying to optimize the system even more. They've been doing several changes. They've been making Xbox Live better. They've been trying to hand out better games. They've been trying to have more sales. They've been doing, you know, new systems such as the Xbox One S. They're trying to bring gamers back to this and then all of a sudden they're doing the whole xbox anywhere and they're also more focusing on xbox as a service and a brand over just being limited to a game console so even now you have this kind of confusion of should i get an xbox one or should i get a pc and install windows 10 and i don't think that's really going to kill the console market because regardless people are just not going to want to play on pcs because they're not going to want to play on pcs even if there's a PC version of the Xbox and you can, you know, get all the stuff on there, people are still going to want a console just because they want a console, and that's totally fine. But what I'm trying to say here is not only even, of course, with price too, not only the PS4 came out at a cheaper price point and it was more powerful, but they've given a overall better image. And image has really been a thing 
that is important with all this. I mean, hell, if you if you don't think image is important for a company, why do they spend so much on PR and marketing? Why do they spend so much on advertising? Why is it that Microsoft has desperately been trying to turn around the image of the Xbox One coming from a type of totalitarian gaming machine that controls what you're doing to this is for you guys, this is for the gamers. It's not for us, it's for the gamers. So that's why they're really trying to do that right there. But because that, a lot of people are going to go with the PS4 because it's the PS4. A lot of people are also going to end up getting the PS4 because other people are going to recommend the PS4 to them. And because other people at work, at school, just other family members, they're going to have the PS4. There are more PS4s in the wild than there are Xbox Ones. And even though the Xbox Scorpio is going to be the most powerful system of this generation, it's not coming out for until 13 months after the PS4 Pro. We still have to remember that. Now, I know Sega had done this before. The Sega Dreamcast came out and it's a great system. I still love the Dreamcast. And it's, I would say, you know, it is less powerful than the PlayStation 2. That's factual right there. There's a few other things as well. It didn't have a DVD drive, but I remember when I was looking up stuff and because I'm weird, I was researching game systems and all, and I was looking to the Sega stuff. And Sega was kind of shaking in their boots a little bit. So what they ended up doing was some people asked them, they're like, well, you know, the PS2 was just announced and it's going to be a lot more powerful. And this was like about a year before the PS2 came out. So they asked Sega what they were thinking. And Sega pretty much said, well, the PS2 is more powerful. We're not going to debate that. But the PS2 is coming out in a year. The Dreamcast is now. And you can only get the Dreamcast, which is the most powerful system out right now. And you can get these games on it. And what Sega did was for that first year that the Dreamcast was out prior to the PS2, they were just pushing out game after game after game, and they were trying to give it all the support they could. Now, ultimately, the Dreamcast died off. And that's not really because of a lot of people will just say, oh, it's because Sega was Sega or whatever. I mean, that, there were so many factors in it. Um, poor representation of, no, not really poor representation of the product. I say poor representation of the company. You got to remember, this is coming hot off the heels of the three travesties, which were the Sega 32X, the Sega CD, and the Sega Saturn, which are all good systems when you look at them now and realize, wow, what Sega was doing was cool, but they were marketed horribly. And Sega would put out a system, drop it, put out a system, drop it, put out a system, drop it. They did that literally three times. So at that point, people didn't trust Sega because they said, oh, you released that Dreamcast. What, what's going to happen? What, in a year are you going to go out of business? It, that that kind of did happen. But uh, no, what ended up happening was because of that, people lost a lot of their consumer confidence in Sega. So Sega was working to try and get that back. Not as bad as Microsoft, but Microsoft kind of happened with, with the same thing where they got too comfortable. They tried to make this a totalitarian DRM gaming machine. They lost a lot of consumer confidence and they've been working their ass off to get it back. Microsoft didn't even release the system at that point. Like they, did, they didn't have the triple system mess up like Sega did. And look how much they were still suffering off that. So Sega not only released kind of, you know, three bad egg systems, but they also didn't have the DVD drive in there. Uh, they were not doing very well at all, you know, financially, just because uh, I know there were some things, for example, you know, spending all that money on, you know, the companies and all that stuff, that wasn't doing too well. I know other games they were funding, like for example, Shinmu, those were financial failures. And uh, as I said, you know, lack of DVD drive. And then piracy was another thing that really killed the Dreamcast. So while as none of these systems are in any of that category, you know, Sega did really well with the Dreamcast. They did exceptionally well with the first year it came out. Then when the PS2 came out, it started dying off for a lot of reasons. You know, this system was more powerful. It had the DVD drive. This was at the time the cheapest DVD player that you could get. This was 300 bucks. DVD players were like $600. So it had a lot of good things going for it. Now, I don't think Sega or Sony, uh, I call them, Se wow, I called Microsoft Sega. I don't think Microsoft or Sony are in that position by any means, but I do know that Microsoft has plenty of money in the bank to bankroll whatever, and Xbox isn't really the most financially sound brand, I would say. They're still working on, you know, actually making a good profit on that because they've lost a lot of money on the original Xbox and the 360 and then all the other stuff they're doing. And Sony themselves as a company, they're not doing super hot, honestly, because of a lot of things. I don't think they're at the Sega level where they're about to go bankrupt in a few months, but PlayStation is doing pretty well as a brand, and the rest of Sony isn't really doing too hot. So 
I'm hoping, you know, just for Sony's sake, that the PS4 Pro does do well. Now, another thing that honestly utterly perplexes me with the PS4 Pro is uh, this is actually a disappointment to me. Found out that the PS4 Pro will not have a 4K Blu-ray drive. You're selling this device, you're selling it as a 4K capable, 4K HDR device, yet it's not going to have a 4K Blu-ray drive in your competition, the Xbox One S does have a 4K Blu-ray drive. Now, yes, these systems do have Blu-ray drives in them already, but a 4K Blu-ray drive, it's another upgrade on there as well. So you can't play 4K Blu-rays in a regular Blu-ray player is what I'm trying to say. These ones cap out at like 3D Blu-rays, that's it. And that's a real big disappointment because right now I could go out and pick up the Xbox One S, 300 bucks, get a 4K Blu-ray player in there, hook it up to my 4K TV, and be happy. I didn't buy it because I just, I don't use the Xbox One enough to really justify that purchase of just, you know, the little incremental upgrade. And I was honestly banking, honestly, I was honestly banking on the PS4K or the PS4 Pro having a 4K Blu-ray drive in there and it didn't. So kind of a disappointment. I don't know what Sony was thinking. They were trying to, I guess, cut corners and cut costs on there. But then it's especially weird thinking that, look, there's there's a lot of companies involved with Blu-ray, right? It's not only Sony's thing, but you think of Blu-ray as Sony's thing. So how the hell is it that if Blu-ray is, you know, known as Sony's format, that they didn't put a 4K Blu-ray player in their 4K capable gaming device, but the competition is going to have a 4K Blu-ray player in its gaming device that you can get right now, and again, the Xbox One S is the cheapest 4K Blu-ray player on the market. Right now, from what I've seen, 4K Blu-ray players alone are about 400 bucks, Xbox One S, 300 bucks. You might as well get an Xbox One S. Now let's say, you know, the PS4 Pro does super well and all that stuff, and the Xbox One comes out, well, the Xbox One Scorpio comes out and it does exceptionally well as well. I don't know if it's gonna come out too late into the system's life cycle. Now, a lot of my viewers, right, a lot of my viewers, you all are probably, I don't know, somewhere between like, I want to say 12 and 23, 24, 25 in age. Something like that, I would say. I think that's fair, right? Point is, what I'm trying to say is these systems right here, the Xbox, I don't have a 360 on hand. The, well, th I don't have PS3 on hand is what I'm trying to say. The Xbox 360, the PS3, the Wii, people now look at those as nostalgic devices, because the seventh generation of consoles was so weird. It started in 2005 when the Xbox 360 came out, and it kind of, I guess, finished, you could say. It's still getting some support, but it kind of finished in 2013 when these systems, the successes, came out. That's a very long time. That's eight years for a console life cycle, which is really strange. Console life cycles normally last three to five years. And that's just something that has always been kind of a standard. So now we're getting about three years into the cycle, and I just realized I kind of messed up my math earlier when I said these systems are about three and a half years old. They're about two and a half. But uh, we're getting, you know, about three years into the system's life cycle. This is about the time where companies start thinking, okay, uh, in the next year or two, we need to put out the PlayStation 5. Or we need to put out the Xbox 12. I, I, Microsoft doesn't know how to count. I don't know what their next system is going to be called. But because of the precedence of the seventh generation of game consoles, a lot of people think that you get a game console and it should last minimum seven or eight years. And that's just kind of a new standard that's been set with that. So that's why this thing is going on. And then you have to realize as well that the Xbox Scorpio is going to be coming out four years into the Xbox One's life cycle. Now, is this a bad thing? I, I don't know. And we're not going to know until the Scorpio comes out. I mean, if you think about it, the PS3 came out in 2006, and some of the best games for it came out in 2009, 2010, three or four years, you know, into the cycle. The Xbox 360 as well. I distinctly remember, you know, 2009 was a really prevalent year for the Xbox 360. That was four years in the system's life cycle. So is that kind of like the twilight peak of these systems? I'm not sure. But for all I know, the Xbox Scorpio could come out at the best time. But then the thing is with developers as well, they're going to have to get used to the spec, like the, the dual spec of these systems, you see? The nice thing about game consoles and developing for them is if I develop for a PlayStation 4, the idea was previously, you know, bad, bad example, let's talk about the 360. If I'm a game developer and I'm developing for the Xbox 360, 
It doesn't matter if you picked up your Xbox 360 in 2005 or 2012, brand new. The point is, if I make a spec for a game, and I develop the game on that spec and everything, it's going to play well on all the systems. The Xbox One and the Xbox and the PS4, they were going to be the same thing as well too. But now we have these have systems. We're going to have the PS4 Pro, so we're going to have games that are going to play on the PS4 spec, or they're going to then play on the PS4 Pro spec if you have that and it's capable of it. And then you're going to have the Xbox Scorpio, which is going to be a bit of a powerhouse from what I'm seeing. Now, honestly, one of my fears for these new systems is going to be, what if they end up making games that don't run properly on the original hardware just because they were designed to run better and be more optimized for the better hardware, like the Pro or the Scorpio. And we've seen that with the 3DS, actually. There is one game, uh, Xenoblade Chronicles 3D, does not work on the original 3DS. It is a new 3DS exclusive. And I've actually seen a video where somebody performed a mod where they ended up clocking, like, underclocking the new 3DS to the equivalent of the old 3DS CPU speed, and the game was completely unplayable. There's been other games on there, such as uh, Hyrule Warriors, that look and play horribly on the new 3DS, but play pretty well on the new 3DS. And I feel like that might happen as well too on here, and I don't want it to happen, I honestly don't, but we've already seen some bad games that perform poorly. Some people might say Fallout 4, some people might cite other titles. I'm gonna try and link this or put some footage in or something if I remember to, but uh, Lichdom Battle Mage. Uh, Digital Foundry ended up making a video analyzing that game, and it's completely unplayable. Well, it was. It's been patched now. But the point is, that game got developed, got certified, passed certification and everything, passed QA testing, and got printed onto a retail disc and was sold to be run in a production level environment on the PS4 and the Xbox One, and it was completely unplayable. It was, I think they ended up dumping down the resolution a little bit later from 1080p to 900p, but the point is the game looked horrible, it had like 10 minute loading times, uh, it was running at a solid like 8 frames a second. The game was unplayable. It played like an early alpha of a game. That was it. And then it got patched to become playable, but the point is we've seen that on there. Now what if a game like that ended up coming out and the developers just kind of said, oh, well, that's obviously because you have that old system from 2013. You can't use that for our game. That's not, you know, very good. It's not going to work that well. You need to get the PS4 Pro for the optimal experience, or you need to end up getting the Xbox Scorpio for the optimal experience. And we're already seeing games that are kind of split already. I know Rise of Tomb Raider, it's supposed to have three modes uh, for the Pro. It's supposed to have a 1080p 30 mode with max uh, settings and all that, so max graphical settings. It's supposed to have a 1080p 60 frames-ish mode. It's unlocked 60, uh, but it's going to have a 1080p 60 mode where the, the uh, graphics are lowered and everything, and probably the resolution is lowered but it runs at about 60 frames, and it's gonna have the 4K mode. And that's another thing, we don't know what's going on with the 4K stuff. I'm personally a person, I would rather have 1080p 60 over 4K 30. That's just me because I'd rather have that better frame rate, and I don't need my games to look completely pretty. If they look pretty, cool, but I mean, for example, I was playing the Battlefield 1 beta recently, and I was just kind of playing on some lower settings, and I was running an average of like 80, 90 frames per second, and the game played pretty well on my PC. I mean, it didn't. It looked all right. It didn't look the prettiest, but it played really damn well, and that's what I liked about it. But what I'm trying to say is, we've already seen games that are barely playable on these systems. And while is that might just stay like that, or they might get patched up later, I think that might become a bit more of a precedence with these new systems. And then people might feel like they have forced to upgrade off of these older systems to the new ones. And then if you're going to do that at that point. Why the hell did you release this system under the PS4 environment or the Xbox One environment? We're not going to truly know how beneficial or how bad this is going to be until we really see the PS4 Pro hit the market and then come out afterwards. But I don't know, even though, you know, some companies, these companies, it feels like they have future proof their systems a little bit. At the same time, they were a bit underwhelming. And while it's cool, like for example, the PS4, this is going to get HDR patched into it. And Sony was really forward thinking with that, especially with the, even the VR stuff and all that too. They've been signing the PS4 and saying, this is going to be the better system for VR. This is going to look better. It's going to have, you know, more features, all this other stuff. So 
I'm not sure what's going to happen, you guys. I really don't know what's going to happen here. So that's why I'm kind of looking for you all have a discussion. I want to see what's going on and what you all think to see if the PS4 Pro is going to still be better than the Xbox Scorpio, if the PlayStation 4 overall is going to be better than the Xbox overall, or if the Xbox One will completely rise and take over. Because one other thing, the Xbox 360 also had about a year early on the market in 2005. And it did really well. And it was above in, you know, it was it was better with multi-plats because, you know, the architecture, people were able to work with it earlier. It was a more developer-friendly system compared to the PS3. And uh, it was cheaper, a bunch of other factors as well. Also kind of helped that the 360 was pretty unreliable, so people end up buying like five of them over the course of the life cycle of the system. But point is, near the end of the system's life cycle, the PS3 ended up taking over. And now the Xbox 360, while as it did still sell well, it was the technically the worst selling seventh generation console. The Wii just completely shot off there. The PS3, in the end, did sell better than the Xbox 360. Despite the Xbox 360 having a bunch of consoles sold because of you know system failures or people just really wanted to gobble them up because they were cheaper. And also in addition to that, you know, coming out a year earlier on market and hitting the market on there. So that's why it's like it's one of those things. The PS4 has already been doing better than the Xbox One. And I hope that the PS4 Pro is going to do well, like we'll see what happens, but who knows, maybe near the end of the system's life cycle or in a few years, the Xbox One will catch up. And even if it catches up on sales, awesome. But the most important part for us is they need to catch up with games, with compatibility, with exclusives and all that too. Because I will say overall, that is one thing I feel like the PS4 really does have over the Xbox One right now in its environment, and that is exclusives because there are more exclusives coming out on the PS4 and more diverse titles coming out on the PS4 than the Xbox One. Some people might say, oh, well, you know, this game is exclusive, this game, and while is this system, the Xbox One still has its exclusives, a lot, of system, a lot of games are also coming over to PC. And for example, Quantum Break is not an exclusive to Xbox One, just like No Man's Sky is not an exclusive on PS4. Some people try and tout those games as exclusives, like they say No Man's Sky was an exclusive on PS4. It's not. I can play the game on my PC. It's not an exclusive. Just like Quantum Break. It's on Xbox One, it's not on PS4, but I can pick it up on my PC. Anyways, even though this video has kind of been a bit all over, as I said at the beginning of the video, I don't know if the Xbox Scorpio will outdo, you know, in terms of sales, in terms of games, in terms of, you know, getting that user love and everything, I don't know if the Xbox One is going to outdo the PS4 Pro. I don't know if the PS4 Pro is going to outdo the Xbox Scorpio. We, we don't know these things yet because these systems aren't out yet. So I would like to see this, you know, come the end of 2017. We're, we're going to see what's going on because it's going to be here inevitably, you know, regardless of what happens. But... I just don't know how to feel about it, man. Anyways, this is Mr. Mario signing off. Thank you all for watching, everyone. If you enjoyed the video, a like would be appreciated, especially if you got all the way to the end. You're awesome. And if you didn't like the video, you can, you can dislike it as well, too. I wouldn't mind that either. <laughs>